Well, hey everyone, thanks for joining the stream or checking out the recording later. Welcome to Test Driven Development in React. Uh, I'm Josh Justice. I go by coding it wrong on the internet and you can watch along and decide if you agree that I'm coding it wrong. We'll find out together. Um, so I just wrapped up a React Native Test Driven Development uh, series, a part series before this. And so you can check that out on my YouTube channel if you're interested in React Native as well. Testing tools are somewhat different on React Native, but we're back on the web, which is where I began. So a little bit of background about, about me. Uh, I've worked in web development for 14 years. Uh, it was mostly back-end development, like most web development was for a lot of that time. And then in the last couple of years, I've been transitioning towards the front end. So something that I'm particularly passionate about as I do like speaking and writing and live streaming is helping developers build better apps faster. And so I feel like testing is a big part of that and test-driven development in particular as well. So that's what we're gonna be talking about together. Um, it's been interesting, especially working on the front end, I've started to understand better the distinction between just testing and test-driven development. So as you might have heard before, or maybe not, in test-driven development, you write your tests first, and then you write the functionality that causes the test to pass. It seems kind of unintuitive, but we'll talk about some of the benefits of it. So it's also beneficial to write your tests after you write your code, and I think on the front end, that tends to be more common. Um, but the distinction between the two has become more obvious to me. Writing tests after your code is mostly about confidence, getting uh, an assurance that your app works and will continue to work as you make changes to it. So that's really good and useful, and that helps you develop, develop better apps faster, for sure. So what are the benefits of test-driven development? Why would you take this unintuitive approach to write the tests first? Well, I think you'll see that over time, so please kind of hang out on the stream or the recordings to find out, but let me give you a quick preview. So uh, one of the things that TDD can help you with is what kinds of tests to write when. There's the ongoing debates about the test pyramid, and should you write more end-to-end -end tests and integration tests, more isolated unit tests? Well, test-driven development can help you with that. Um, also, you uh, might run into, um, and I can speak to this from experience, because in my client project right now, due to a few different constraints and reasons, uh, we're actually, I'm actually writing the tests after I write the implementation, so I can experience, explain some of these pain points. So when you're writing the test afterwards, another thing that can happen is you can end up writing tests that are just a duplicate of the exact same logic, like literally copied and pasted out of your production code. And that doesn't benefit a whole lot. That's just a matter of, um, uh, you know, uh, running the exact same code twice. That doesn't really confirm anything. So uh, when you're doing um, test-driven development, uh, you end up not testing the implementation so much as testing the interface. So you write what a piece of code should look like it should do from the outside, and then you implement it. So that can make uh, your tests less brittle for failure. They can really be testing something more genuine, and they can enable uh, refactoring a bit better. Um, another thing is, um, as you might imagine, if you write the test first, you're going to end up writing much more testable code. So if you've ever gotten code working and felt really good about it, and then gotten frustrated that you couldn't find a way to test that code, uh, test driven development works because before you do anything else, you can write the test. And that may be frustrating at first, but it helps you out on the long run. Um, also, as a result of this, test driven development, in one manner of speaking, leads to 100% test coverage because you don't write a line of production code until you write a test that requires you to use that line. Um, so that can be helpful. Um, in my work in uh, Ruby in particular, uh, we did that's where I learned testing and we did a ton of testing and we never looked at a code coverage tool. I know some Rubyists do, but for us, the test driven development approach was enough assurance that our app was covered by tests and that we were good to go. So if you don't like dealing with those test coverage numbers and you don't like having to jump through hoops to get up to 100%, test driven development could be interesting. The last factor, and this one I can't really justify right now, you'll have to see and make your own decision as we go, is the idea that test-driven development leads to better designed code. Um, particularly at the unit test level, at the lower level, um, as you um, uh, test your individual components, uh, that confirms that those components are loosely coupled and highly cohesive. So the components make sense on their own without being plugged into the rest of your application. That can lead to more flexible code. And we'll see that, I think, as we go. So that's a bit of an introduction to why I like test-driven development, and I think it helps us build better apps faster. Um, if you're interested in these things and you're looking for something to do, coming up next week, I'm actually speaking on these topics at Connect Tech, a conference in Atlanta, Georgia, here where I live. Um, I'm giving two talks, one on test-driven development in React, which is going to be a shortened version of this live stream series, and then another one doing test-driven development in Vue.js. So interestingly, a lot of these principles and even the tools are very much the same across different front-end frameworks. So uh, as far as I can tell, tickets are still on sale. So come join us at Connect Tech. Uh, if you can join, that would be great. 
Um, other than that, let's jump into the content of the stream. Um, so today for part one, we're going to be starting building out an application. And over this whole series, we're going to be building an application together. Um, there's a repo for it here. It's on my uh, GitHub account, Coding It Wrong, under React TDD Live Stream. And you'll be able to check it out. I'll put up a pull request each stream session to see it um, so that you can kind of review and take a look later at the code changes that were done. So the application we're going to build is called Opinion 8. Like it's like opinion space A-T-E. So this is my go-to kind of build for fun app for practice. Uh, it's an app where we take make a list of restaurants and dishes that are available at those restaurants and then we rate those dishes to see if we like them or we don't like them. Because a lot of different types of restaurants that I go to, I forget which dishes I've tried and if I like them or not. So this is an app I need. Um, I've started it many times, but I've never finished it. So maybe as a part of this series, we'll actually get it working and actually be able to use it. Because when I go to these restaurants, I just wonder about the fact that I've built part of this app five times and never built the full thing. So that's what we're going to be building. And today in the first session, we're going to be focusing on setting up our tooling. Because what is a new React app without bike shedding the choices of tools that we're going to use? It's just part of the, part of the process. And um, I want to make sure that you can get it all set up. So interestingly, um, the, the setup we're going to do to get different testing tooling working in our app is going to actually work just fine whether you're doing test-driven development or test-after development. It's all the same tools. So uh, let's walk through it together. Um, I will show you, you can probably see if you squint hard enough, the tabs I have across the top here and what the tools are. So I'll describe them as we go through them as we add them in one at a time. Uh, the first note is um, that I'm using uh, Yarn as my package management client. Uh, you know, if you uh, probably all of us know about NPM, the built-in uh, Node package management client, and but Yarn is an alternative. And uh, I've tried going back to NPM a few times, but Yarn is always just a bit smoother, a bit faster, a bit more reliable for me. It fits my expectations of what's happening, so I use Yarn. And so you'll see me use that command. You can check it out. All the links to all these tools are in the the episode notes, either below the live stream or below the YouTube video later. So you can check out those links there to get them installed. So I have the app started up here, and I just have an empty package JSON file uh, with a little, conf uh, little you know, config there as well, but no packages added. And so the first thing we're going to add, um, as far as bundlers are concerned, um, I use Create React App a lot. It's great that that's the default for the React community. Um, but I'm actually, for this live stream, I'm going to be using Parcel instead. So I just tried it out for the first time in earnest a few days ago. Um, and was able to get it working. And I found that it was really useful for, uh, for React apps. It fit really smoothly. It gave me a lot of options. And in particular, it's going to give us some options for adding some custom Babel config that may be useful depending on where we, where we go with state management in the future. So Parcel is fun. So we're going to give it a try. So let's start out in the app here. Um, I'm going to open up my cheater window in the other monitor so I can remember what I've set up in the past. Uh, and let me just make sure the code is visible. Yeah, we're good to go. All right, so I'm going to run in here a uh, yarn add dev. So that's the equivalent of npm install save dev. Um, and that's two dashes there. You can see that if I kind of pull this across. Yarn add dev parcel bundler. So in the deal with parcel and a lot of these tools that I'm recommending is that they're zero or little configuration tools. So they'll do a lot for you out of the box. Um, this install is going to run a little while because I'm installing these tools separately. Uh, as a bit of a confession, I have some virus scan software that runs on my computer that sometimes installs, uh, slows this down. So sometimes I need to force quit the virus software and no worries, it starts itself back up again within 15 or 30 seconds or so. But in the meantime, I get a nice speed boost. And you'll see there, there was that speed boost that I got as a result of configuring it. I just want to remotely execute code on my computer, so please let me do that. All right, so we've got parcel installed here. And so now what we can do is set up an NPM script to run it. So let's put that up here. We'll just use the typical start that's common, and it's just parcel. And then we want to specify for parcel an entry point that we're going to use. And because this is a web application, we can actually just point to an HTML file, index.html. So now we get, we're not, this is not create React app that starts us out with files. Parcel doesn't automatically know about React, and so we need to get it started. But this will be pretty quick. So we'll create an index.html file in the root of our project. And I think Visual Studio Code will help me with an autocomplete for HTML. Nope. Yeah, there we go. OK, cool. We got a little autocomplete for HTML here. And then let's call the app React TDD Live Stream. Let's review what else we have. We have some meta tags. That's fine. IE Edge, I suppose. We could do that. Uh, make it fit on iPhone. Pretty important. 
Um, and then we have a CSS file and a JS file. Now, I don't uh, think we're actually going to get into any CSS in this application, so uh, that may come later. And, but let me take that out for now, and we'll put that in at the appropriate time once we add in some sort of uh, visual component library. I will let you all vote on which one we should use. We could try out something new together. So um, we have a script tag here, and I'm going to just put it in a source folder. So this is actually going to point to a source file. I'm going to put it down in the body, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. And then, as is usual for React, we're going to create a root element and just put it in there. So what's going to happen when, as you recall, we set a parcel to run this file is that it's going to find this HTML file, see that a script is referenced, and then it's going to go and start crawling that script and bundling it together. So uh, we need to create this script. So source main.js. All right, and so this, if you've ever set up a React app from scratch, this is going to be our typical stuff. Um, but of course, before we do that, we want to go ahead and import React. So let's just do that. Yarn add. Uh, these are now production dependencies, not dev. Uh, so we'll add React and React DOM. Let's get those added in real quick. Yep, and then they show up in there. React 16.5.2, which is current as of when the screencast is being recorded. So now in our main.js file, let's get it going. We'll import React. Yeah. Import React DOM. And then, uh, well, let's come back to that in a second. So first, we're going to get a root element, document get element by ID, root. And so this is going to go and get this root element out of our document that's already there. So this is why we've put the script tag down below, because that ensures that the root element is already there. So we get that element, uh, and then we're going to call react dom.render to render our React application. We're going to render it to root. And then, so what are we going to render? Well, uh, we're going to follow the convention that React, uh, Re create React app has that I think is great to have an app element. And that's where all of that's going to start. And that, this way, this wiring up to the DOM just lives in one file. So let's import app from app. And we'll create an app file. And then in the app file, we're going to import React from React. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and set this up as a class component uh, because I know it's going to need to be a class eventually. So uh, I do like functional components, but we're going to do a class component here. Oh, class app extends React components. Render return div class name equals hello. Uh, hello world. And we'll use that class name a bit later. All right, so that's our app. Uh, I'm sure I've forgotten something because I usually do, but let's give it a run and see what happens. Um, the other thing is I'm not gonna just go through here and copy and paste all the config in advance because that's not great for learning. We're gonna run across some error messages as we go here together and we'll see together kind of how to resolve them. But I do have some reference material in case we get stuck. So this isn't the most boring live stream ever. So let's run yarn start, which is just the same as npm start or npm run start. This should start up parcel as you can see in the output there. It's starting up. Uh, the default host for parcel is localhost 1234. It's actually really nice for me because it doesn't conflict with the default port number for Rails, which I use a lot for my backend. Okay, and this is all done and loaded up. So let's open this up. I think I have localhost defaulted to go to a different browser. So let's just open it up here in Firefox, my favorite. Um, and sure enough, hello world is there. It comes up. Let's check the console to make sure there's no errors. And we're good to go. So this is really great. Um, and I think, I haven't dug into this too much, but I think this is actually pretty cool. Although Parcel says that it doesn't have built-in React support, it's apparently able to figure out JSX support to be able to run JSX just fine out of the box, which is pretty sweet. So um, let's let's go ahead and do a commit here. Uh, yarn lock, is that, that's not been, huh. I wonder why that's different. Well, I don't know. Set up. React. I'm curious why the package JSON is not showing a difference. Let me figure this out real quick. Well, it's okay. I can come back and fix this later if we have to. All right, so I like doing nice small commits, and so now we have setting up React as commits. So we've got Parcel now building our app, and we've got React running in it. So what's next? So the next thing I'd like to add in is Cypress for end-to-end -end testing. 
So Cypress is getting well known and popular. Um, there's a lot of great benefits to it for end-to-end -end testing of your app and other kinds of testing as well. Um, but Cypress in particular is really targeted, it's only a few years old, and it's targeted at modern front-end apps with lots of asynchronous functionality and interactivity. So Cypress is a really great choice. Um, it's great for test-driven development or just test after, so I highly recommend it. So we're going to install it, not using NPM, but using Yarn instead. So let's do it. I, I think we can actually leave the app up and running. So let's do it. My console is opening up. So yarn add dev cypress. I was going to add, this one might take a little while to install. So if it does, um, we'll kind of look ahead and figure out what we want to do to get it started. Let's kill that virus scan again. No, it's, it's just doing fine so far. So what we're going to do, we're going to get a smoke test set up for our end-to-end -end test as well as our lower level component test, just to confirm that we've got all the pieces hooking up and the test can run. Then next time when we get together, we'll kind of start doing test-driven development to start out a new feature. So uh, let's, while this is installing, maybe we'll go ahead and talk about some of the other upcoming pieces. So Cypress has its own built-in test runner. It's a sort of self-contained suite of tools. Again, uh, zero configuration, which is really nice. Um, for other kinds of tests, unit tests and component tests, I like to use Jest. Um, I also like Mocha, which is a bit of an older tool, but Jest is, as it mentions here, a zero configuration testing platform. So that's really nice to have as much included out of the box as possible. Unfortunately, Jest doesn't have React testing included out of the box, or I think it has some, but I know that Enzyme is a library that's very popular for testing Re uh, React components. So we're gonna be using Enzyme together, and that's gonna take just a little bit of configuration to add into Jest. All right, let's see if my stalling for time is done. Okay, so Cypress is added in. So now we can add a script for Cypress. Pull up my cheat sheet over here. Yeah. So I think we'll call it test end to end. Um, should we do that? I think it'll be quicker just to say end to end like that. That'll be good. And then for that, we run Cypress open. So that'll run Cypress for us. And now the first time we run this, it's actually gonna, Cypress is actually gonna install the config files for us. Again, it's a zero configuration solution, so we don't need to set up initial config files. Cypress will do it for us, which is really nice. So we'll just get that running, get that force quitting. You can't see my dock, but there's a little Cypress dock icon that pops up. And so here's Cypress with a little instructions here. We've added some folders and example tests to your project. Great, and so Cypress has a GUI test runner here that shows up for running purposes. We're not gonna run these tests right now, like let's actually create a hello world test. So let me, um, so Cypress adds a few different folders, but then under integration, there's an examples folder. And we'll just delete that. That can be great to peruse through on your own. But yeah, Cypress is really easy to add to an existing project. So whatever front end project you're working on, even if it's a server rendered app, actually, Cypress works great for testing those as well. Whatever web, web app you're working on, I encourage you to try installing Cypress in a branch and see how it goes. All right, so we're gonna create a file. We'll just call it smokespec.js. So this is gonna be a Cypress smoke test. And so Cypress, does, if you're familiar with Mocha, Chai, and Sign-On, that testing uh, stack, Cypress includes all those and works off of all of those, so that's nice. So we can type our typical describe. We're gonna say this is describe my, uh, we'll call it smoke test. So in this describe here, we'll say it Make sure the uh, welcome message comes up. Okay, so we're gonna make sure the welcome message comes up. And so in Cypress test, we'll talk much more about Cypress's API in the future, but we have a CY variable that we can call visit on to visit a page. We're gonna visit localhost 1234. And then we can just say call, call in on that, uh, contains hello world. So we're gonna make sure it contains hello world. So when we save this, if we switch back over to our Cypress test runner, we see that it's updated and smoke spec shows up over there. When we click on this, it's gonna open a new instance of Chrome uh, that's specific to Cypress. It's all set up and independent. And as it runs through here, we'll just take just a second to get started. I think you can actually see on the side here that it's kind of running. Let me do this so we can see. So Cypress is getting started and it's trying to be going. Those error 500s are fine. There's no problem at all. Cool, and so we can see here that our site has come up, our Hello World app is loaded up in Cypress's GUI, and on the left-hand side, we see our smoke test saying that it's passed, um, and it shows us Hello World right there. So we're gonna dig a lot more into Cypress in the future, but right now we've got Cypress set up and we're good to go. So that's great. So let's go ahead and commit that. 
Looks good. Add Cypress. Okay, next for Jest. So let's get Jest installed for our lower level tests. Let's see here. Uh, we're gonna do a lot yarn, add dev Jest. And again, a lot like Cypress, Jest is included. I went back and forth on using Mocha because since Cypress already uses Mocha, it would be nice to have some consistency. But on the flip side, um, there's some, you know, the setup you have to do to get Mocha and Chai and Sign on is a little bit much if you haven't done front end testing before. And so Jest is a little bit nicer out of the box. I find that Jest has nicer, uh, more clear error messages than the Mocha stack. So that's really cool as well. And uh, I haven't done a ton with snapshot testing, uh, but my friend Juddy has, and uh, so maybe he might be able to join us and show us a bit of what snapshot testing is all about and how it can help. So cool, so we're gonna go with Jest, and I think I've just managed to fill up the time for it to get installed. All right, I'm pretty sure we're gonna need to do uh, some additional testing, but let's just set up our script here, and what are we gonna do? Yes, test, for unit tests, we're gonna do Jest, and I'm gonna set up the folder. I'm gonna say there's gonna be a test folder with a unit subfolder. Mm. Let's, let's not do that. For our test setup here, I think this will be fine. Star.spec, uh, let's do star star, star.spec.js. Cool, and I see a Juddy has come on. Uh, he says, hello, Juddy, hello. Juddy is one of my most consistent uh, live joiner viewers uh, back in the React Native live stream, and he had a lot of great ideas and feedback and comments. So, Juddy, I'm very glad that you're here. Uh, he lives in New Zealand. Uh, he is a uh, looking to be a developer advocate, so we call him a Kiwi Avocado. It's very exciting, um, and he's really great, so you should get to know him. Uh, join him in the chat, or I might I will retweet his stuff in the future so you can meet him that way. All right, Juddy, so we're diving in. We just got a uh, parcel set up, Cypress set up, and now we are putting getting Jest set up with Enzyme for our unit and component testing. So we have this set up here. So let's in let's make this test folder now. Test, uh, we will create a, a unit folder, and then we'll create a file smokespec.js. So again, this is a smoke spec. Um, and we'll just get this set up. We'll say uh, describe. So Jest has a very similar syntax to Mocha and Chai, but there's some differences. So we'll see if we regret together that I've gone with with this. Uh, so, but a lot of it is similar. So we're describe. Uh, let's say here smoke test. So first we're just going to do a unit test that's not testing the UI. It's just testing some JavaScript logic. Uh, it can, can can handle the truth. Let's say that. We're going to confirm that it can handle the truth. Expect true to to equal little Visual Studio Code autocomplete. Very nice. Expect true to equal true. So let's try that. Yarn uh, yarn unit. These are different commands than I've used elsewhere, so it might take a little while for me to get familiar with them. So Jest is trying to run. It's running smoke spec, and it's passed. So cool. So we have Jest running. So let's just make a commit for that. All right, all right. So next, let's go to Enzyme. So we might, we're gonna have some standalone JavaScript classes, so just Jest by itself to test those will be fine. But Enzyme is gonna be useful for testing our components. And this is a big part of my focus in test driven development is called outside-in testing, where we do end-to-end -end testing of the whole app and then component testing of individual components, some individual components as well. And you'll get to learn about all those trade-offs as we go. So Enzyme takes a little bit of setup work, so let's kind of see what's involved in that. I think I will look at my cheat sheet again. All right, so we're gonna add dev enzyme. We also need to add enzyme adapter React 16 because enzyme has different adapters for React 16 and 15, maybe older versions if it supports it. Um, and I think that's it for right now. I'm sure we'll need something else, but let's add that in and do the basic setup and then see if any errors come up and what we need to do from there. While it's installing, another thing we need to do is we're going to need a setup file for Jest uh, to get go working with Enzyme. So in here, this comes straight out of the Enzyme docs. We say import Enzyme from Enzyme, import adapter from Enzyme adapter React 16, and then we just say Enzyme configure adapter new adapter. So this is just where we tell Enzyme to use the React 16 adapter. Then to get that loaded, when our application starts, uh, we just need to put in a jest config down here in the package JSON. Jest. 
and it's called setup test framework script file. Very verbose config file name. Root dir, and we actually type in root dir with the less than and greater than there. Test uh, setup JS. All right, so I think that'll run that script file. Let's just do yarn test to make sure it doesn't already blow up. Oh, that's right, yarn unit. I might need to switch that out if I keep typing test every time. We'll see. This runs. Okay, so this is interesting. So check this out. Now, I don't know all of the details behind this. We can see that uh, Jest encountered an unexpected token. And what's, what Jest is doing here is when it sees the import token, that's where there's a problem. So I guess what's happening, I haven't looked into all the details to find out, but I guess is that now that we're using an import in the setup file that Jest is trying to run, Jest is saying that it doesn't have support for the import syntax out of the box. And so what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to set up Jest with Babel support to be able to do Babel transpilation. So that's gonna be that's gonna be great. That's gonna be useful for other purposes as well. Um, and we're gonna be using the latest Babel 7.1 7 because that's the latest and greatest and it's really good. Um, this is, takes a little bit of fiddling to get it together. So let's see how boring or entertaining it is. So, so for to add to dev, we're gonna add Babel core. Um, I think we're gonna need the Babel syntax for dynamic import. I'm gonna copy that over. Babel plugin syntax dynamic import. Um, Let's stick with the minimum there. Uh, we're also gonna have uh, Babel Jest. And one more thing that I'm pretty sure we'll need, there's something for, for tools that are expecting the older version of Babel, Babel 6, where it was called Babel Core without the at in front of it, there is some kind of a, a bridge package that lets them know to use the newer one instead or something like that. So we can say Babel Core at 7.0.0-0. Um, and again, like this is stuff that's not super obvious, but you have to do some reading around. So I'm glad that I put together this setup video to show it. All right, um, that looks like the basics. So let's install those and see how quickly or not they go. We can go ahead and start with our Babel RC file though. Incidentally, Babel 7 has some different file names you can use for the, Babel, uh, for the config file, but I found that at least one of these tools only use this one. All right, so, uh, Presets, I wanna specify a preset for Babel. Um, I believe, I'm pretty sure, something in our dependency tree already has Babel preset env. When I was playing around with this earlier, I didn't find the need to manually import that. It could be a good idea to do it, but let's just see if this works as it is. Now we'll add plugins. Again, we're kind of taking a, not a test-driven approach, but an error-driven approach here, where we, we're just gonna set up just enough to fix the current error we're getting. So we get Babel with the syntax dynamic import. All right, so let's see how much I regret not running through this right before the live stream. Okay, and it passes. So this is great. So what do we do? We, this was enough uh, Babel configuration to get just working. Um, so let's, you know what, I'm gonna actually, yeah, no, we need to add this all in one, one fell swoop. Yeah. Uh, so let's say, oh, let's not commit it yet because we haven't actually written a test with en that's using Enzyme. So let's do that. We'll make a spec for the app file. Let me look at my example here. Okay, so in our spec, we are gonna to wanna to import React. And again, we're gonna go much more into depth in Enzyme in the future, but here is just like the smoke test version, simplest possible version of the test. We're gonna be using JSX in the file, so we need React and scope to do that. Um, and then we import something called mount from Enzyme. This is a function that lets us mount an individual component to use for testing purposes. Uh, then we want to import our real app uh, component. I have been using relative paths. I, that may or may not be required. Let's try without relative paths. That'd be nice if we didn't have to. That's much prettier. So let's just see if this blows up in our face. So we're going to describe app. So in this, we're going to say it renders hello world. And of course, for these purposes, this is very similar to what our end-to-end -end test was doing, but you'll see the difference between the, the focus of end-to-end -end test and component test in the future. So we create a var variable by convention. It's often called wrapper mount. Uh, app. So we're just going to mount the app component. You could pass, use any other JSX syntax to pass arguments, uh, props to the component here, but right now we don't actually need that. So uh, now we, say, we can say expect wrapper.find.hello. And so this is why I gave it a class was I want to be able to find the hello element like this. And then you can ask for the text within it. We expect this to contain 
hello world. So my syntax highlighting is making me nervous here, like I've done something wrong. You may already see the problem. Let me know in the comments if you already see uh, the problem, that's great. But let's try yarn unit and we'll see if this test runs. We want it to see that it can actually confirm that. And it is blown up, excellent. Oh yeah, there we go. We're missing a from. That looks a lot prettier. That's the kind of colors that I would expect to see here instead of red everything. We'll send up, send up ESLint in a while to warn us about some errors like that. Okay, rerunning the test did not pass yet. Okay, so here we go. This says unexpected token with the angle bracket. And so although Parcel was able to automatically set up React and JSX parsing, uh, the, oh yeah, hi, uh, Fine Topher says I was missing a paren after it. Yeah, it, it looked like it. Um, it looks like right now, it, I, think, I think that's not the case because I think the matching parens are right here because this actually, if you haven't seen the syntax before, it actually opens up a nested uh, arrow function here to define the, uh, the, um, the passed in test itself. So yeah, I think we're good to go. Um, yeah, okay, so like I was saying, Parcel was able to automatically identify JSX syntax and include the appropriate Babel transforms, but Jest is not set up that way. So we're gonna need to do that manually. So let's figure that out. So what we're gonna need is uh, yarn add dev Babel preset react. If you've manually set up the uh, tooling before, you'll be familiar with preset react. That gets react going and good to go. Then I think in our Babel config here, we're gonna need to set that up as a preset. Babel preset react. So let's see if that helped. Let's we'll rerun, do the minimum we need to, and then go from there if there's another problem. Cannot find module source app for app spec JS. So this makes me think that the relative, the absolute paths aren't working. So I'm gonna do a relative path for now. And actually I'm gonna make a note in the stream notes to uh, work on rel uh, absolute path because I'd really like to get that working. That'd be nice. And I never figured that out on the last stream. But for now, just to get things working, let's get that relative path going. Loads up and it actually passes. And we can actually confirm that it's really testing things by changing our app component. Uh, we'll say hello y'all instead because I'm from the south. And uh, we'll make sure the test fails. Cool, it correctly failed. So check it out. Um, nice jest errors. We expected the string hello y'all to contain the value hello world, and it did not. So this is great, uh, that was smoother than I thought it would be. So we've got enzyme working, it's testing, we rerun the test, we're good to go. And so we'll commit this and say set up enzyme. All right, cool, so enzyme is working. We can now do end-to-end -end tests and component tests. So the last thing I wanna set up is ESLint. So what I like to say is that uh, ESLint makes JavaScript safe and Babel makes JavaScript awesome. So I want safety. Um, I was just the other day in a test uh, uh, webinar, I was uh, coding JavaScript without ESLint and it was very fragile. It was not great. And as we just saw, I was just very quickly making errors without ESLint to help me. So let's get ESLint installed and good to go. What I'm gonna do yarn add dev ESLint. And then I'm not gonna use ESLint in it. I'm gonna set it up by hand myself. So I actually have my own ESLint configuration. It's called ESLint config coding it wrong. Um, and I can maybe show in a little bit what this helps. Uh, this is an ESLint configuration that doesn't get in the way of refactoring. So it provides a lot of rules for safety um, without causing some problems that I've made another video on, you can check it on my YouTube channel, about when very strict linting rules can keep you from making temporary changes uh, to be able to um, experiment, to try something out. So you might run into the situation where uh, you your app won't even build because of a lint error, because you're just trying to make it do an experiment. Or maybe uh, your app would build, but you get a wall of red squigglies, and so that's not great. Um, so yeah, so I've got my own config that we're gonna use. Yes, lint config, coding it wrong. Um, let's see here. I wanna go ahead and just start with that and see the errors we get so that we can add in the other stuff. Um, so while that's going, I am gonna create an ESLint rc.js. I believe Visual Studio Code will pick up this configuration, so that's nice. Module exports. All right, so we're gonna have extends coding it wrong. And uh, ESLint in my setup, there's no problem with using the JS version of the file. And I like that because I can use not having quotes around things that don't need quotes around them. All right, so coding it wrong. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure this is going to fail pretty spectacularly, but we're going to look at one error at the time to see if you run into similar errors, what you can add to your ESLint config to get things working. Because um, there's nothing more frustrating than a linter that you can't use because when you do it, it gives you bad errors that you don't want, um, but then you end up uh, having mistakes or problems. So we want to set up our linting command. Uh, so let's just put it in here, lint, ESLint, and uh, let's just lint a uh, source star 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 .js and also test. And I think that's gonna lint the files directly under the source folder. Um, I'm not 100% positive, so we'll test that out to make sure. So now we're in yarn lint. I'm expecting lots and lots of errors. So let's see here. In the smoke spec, unexpected token, I like to just kind of start at the bottom of the list. Uh, unexpected token close parentheses. This is interesting. Is that because, I think that's because ESLint is not detecting ES, ES6 syntax. So I think what I want to do is to add, go ahead and add Babel ESLint at this time. So yarn add dev Babel ESLint. This is a, a parser, is that the right word? I mean, I know what parsers are. Uh, yeah, so this this is, ESLint uses the word parser here. This uses Babel for the parser for ESLint. And so this allows more modern syntax to be used. So we can go in here and we can say, okay, now we want our parser to be Babel. ESLint. So ESLint is definitely not a zero config, but that's okay. I, the safety is worth it for me. Cool. So now we're getting a different set of errors. We're not, no longer getting the error, but there's closed parentheses. Now it's saying in the smoke test that describe it and expect are not defined. And sure enough, we're actually getting feedback in ESLint about these as well. So, and that is true. These, these globals are not defined in this file here. Um, interestingly here, notice that it is, uh, VS Code is telling us that this is the just expect function, so it's able to figure that out. Um, so what can we do here? Well, we could uh, ignore them individually, but really there's actually plugins for this that will help. Um, I'm actually not sure why my other settings and my other project were, were handling this, but this could be good to explicitly handle just errors. So let's do that. Um, I think there's probably an ESLint jest config, so let's just find out. ESLint plugin jest. Yeah, there's often plugins. Yep, that's nice and easy. And then it's just a plugin. Cool. One thing I noticed in the docs just there is that this may have some some jest specific rules to warn us about things we might not want to do in our jest tests. So this will be great to add this. All right, so then in our ESLint extends parser, I'll put plugins below that. Just, we'll need some others before we're through, I believe. Nope, that did not work. Plugin just, so what, what, have, what have we missed? Ask, add just, just plugin. You can also whitelist the environment variables provided by Jest, by env just globals true. So yeah, we are gonna wanna do that. Just globals, true. So this is get, this should whitelist those. I think VS Code is already telling us that it's fine, but let's run the lint command as well. And we're good. So yeah, so now this file is handled just fine. Now that we hear the document in main.js, document is not defined. Well, there's an environment setting for that as well. You can just say browser, true. I think to be parallel, I want little quotes around that. Let's rerun that and see if that's fine. And that's accepted, that's great. So now what I wanna do, I wanna make sure that these files at the root of source are also being caught by the linter. So let's go through, I mean, I guess we did. No, we did find that out because main was handled. So that's great. So it looks like that uh, React is being handled as well by the linter um, because Babel is actually covering our uh, use of JSX and stuff like that. Um, but there is a Babel React plugin and I wanna use that to get the React specific rules. So let's just look up that plugin name. No, 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 I'm not talking about Babel, I'm talking about ESLint. Yeah, sorry. Yarn add dev ESLint plugin react. So we'll add that. And we have a react plugin here. And let me see if there's any, oh, there's nothing else to do. Uh, there is also, it is probably gonna warn us about picking a react version, so let's try that. Uh, let's, let's see if we in fact get that warning. No, I just ran that, why would I run that again? That's not what we wanted to do. We wanna run yarn lint. So let's do that. And it succeeds. Okay, well, that's, that's actually good enough for me. Um, cool, so we've got React working. Um, now, is Cypress okay? 
Well, Cypress, okay, so check this out. So when I open Cypress, we get an ESLint warning, but we didn't get it when we ran the command. And that's actually because Cypress is in a different folder. Um, I'm sure you could move that around to get it to live under the test folder. We might play around with that later. But for right now, I'm gonna leave Cypress at the uh, root of the application. So what I'm just gonna do in the package file is to have that folder uh, linted as well. So Cypress, star star, startup.js. That's nice that it has job, does JavaScript files right at the root level as well. So let's get these errors. Ah, so we have errors with a missing semicolon. So my semicolon preferences and cypresses are in conf com conflict, in conflict. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do, you know, we could do that. Uh, there's plugins file, support file, but rather than doing that, I think what I'm just gonna do is go under Cypress integration, because that's where all our tests are gonna go. And we'll just lint that folder. Maybe I'll change my mind later, but that's fine. So now we do get a warning here that CY is not defined for a similar reason. Um, that, that just doesn't exist. And so there is a Cypress uh, ESLint plugin as well. Let me get the name for that. These plugins are nice because you don't have to configure a bunch of things at a low level. ESLint plugin Cypress. So as you can see, everything is getting ESLinted. And so ESLint kind of brings it all together. That's why I wanted to do it last. So we'll go into plugins as Cypress. And we'll lint again. Again, I think Visual Studio Code would tell us. But yeah, the command line and Visual Studio Code confirm that it's working. All right, so I think we have our linter working. So we'll commit ESLint. All right, so let's take a look here. We got yarn, parcel, cypress, jest, enzyme, and ESLint all working. Is that everything we wanted to do today? Yes, that's a big part of it. Let's rerun our test to make sure we haven't broken anything because breaking things is certainly a part of the deal. Uh, so we'll run yarn unit. This can run. It passes. Uh, Cypress is not still open, so we'll run yarn end to end. Cypress is gonna open. And I will say, um, you can run jest in watch mode to keep it running. When I'm working at a, like a unit level, a component level, I will keep jest running on the side. So you'll see that as we go. And Cypress also can run in the background. Today, for now, we've had to do a good amount of restarting because of adding all these project dependencies. Um, so uh, that's been something. Oh, and I just noticed something else we need to add because I'm definitely gonna wanna do that sooner rather than later. Okay, cool. All right, so Cypress is up. We'll run smoke test again to make sure that that works okay. And just confirm that we're good. Waiting and watching. Okay, cool. All right, Cypress is running as well. That's great. So the thing I noticed looking over at my sample project is there's one more thing that I'm gonna wanna do. And here's what I'm gonna wanna do. State foo bar. I wanna set up state. Does the linter like it? Linter's fine with it. Yarn lint. Something's gonna blow up, I think. I'd be surprised if this works automatically. All right, it looks like parcel doesn't like it. Let's rerun parcel and confirm. I'm not actually sure why yes, lint is fine with it. Support for the experimental syntax class properties isn't currently enabled. Um, so it turns out we could actually uh, fix this by installing the class properties syntax, but it turns out we're gonna actually need to install the transform to handle it as well. So let's do that. So this is yarn add dev babel plugin syntax dynamic import. No, plugin, sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. Proposal class properties. This is a personal favorite of mine because I actually got to do a little bit of contributing to this Babel plugin. Um, I gave a conference talk at JS Camp Chicago on that recently, so I'll post that once that's live. Um, but yeah, class properties are great. So uh, that's installed. We're going to need to add it to our Babel RC. Nope. Let's just copy and paste it over. This plugin is a Babel plugin we're going to want. So now yarn start and let's confirm that it starts up okay. All right, it says that it's built. We'll reload the app and it's working, that's great. In fact, just to actually use it, let's let's change it to something useful. Let's call it name uh, viewers and we'll output this.stateViewers. Uh, this.state.name. This will confirm that the name's actually being used. And sure enough, it is. That's great. So let's commit this. Get class 
properties working. And I just knew that that's a transform of, of a language feature that I'd be reaching for very, very soon. So we might as well get it installed at this point. I mean, state is very common in React. Setting up this way rather than in the constructor is great when you can do it that way. Let's rerun all our other commands to make sure they still work, make sure they're all configured properly. Lint works. Unit testing starting up. I suppose I could open another tab. Oh, and it errors out. So what is this? Oh yeah, well we've changed that. So of course that would change. All right, hello viewers. We could pass in a prop, but for right now, that's not really needed. That's fine. And then I think our Cypress test, we're gonna want to change as well. And I'm pretty sure Cypress is gonna work because Cypress, so this is an important note and we'll get into it more later, but Cypress, uh, by default doesn't like start up your app automatically. So you need to have the app running in the background. And so it's hitting the same port number that we're hitting ourselves in the browser. That's just something to keep in mind. And you would get an app not running in Cypress and probably you would figure out pretty quickly what was going on. All right, so the app comes up and it's good to go. Cool. Now did I already commit that? Uh, yeah, so just be a part of getting class properties working. Sweet, so let's let's take a look at what we have in the end. Let's review what we did. We have a package. Well, let's let's look at our code first. So we have an app that's starting up using parcel. We've got an HTML file opening up a main file that's kicking off our React app. And then we just have a hello world component in there, working just fine using ES6 syntax and things like that. We have unit tests that are using Enzyme to uh, mount components individually and test them directly. And we also have Cypress for end-to-end -end tests that's running the whole application hitting URLs. So we can run all these things as well as ESLint. And because Visual Studio Code is also awesome and zero configuration, uh, Visual Studio Code is also giving us linting errors as well. So this is really great. Um, if we look in our package file, there's, I mean, there's a lot of packages pulled in, like that's not, that's more complex than create react app for sure. So there's trade-offs there, but this is what you can do um, if you need to uh, do a custom react setup and it kind of gives you potentially maximum flexibility. So that was a lot of fun. This puts us in great sh shape. So if any of these tools you're not using and you're interested in using them, you can add them individually. I mean, I expect you're probably using Babel in your project, but maybe not ESLint. Maybe you'd like to test out Jest instead of the test runner you're already using. And certainly if you are as frustrated about your end-to-end -end test as most developers are, Cypress would be great to check out. So we've got our project set up and we're good to go. We're gonna get started on Opinion 8, our application for rating restaurants and dishes at restaurants starting next week. Uh, next week, we're going to be able to do a very first feature where we're going to be able to do outside in testing and get an end-to-end -end test as well as a component test working. So this is going to be really great. It's going to give you a quick snapshot of what's involved and a taste of it. And then from there, in future weeks three and beyond, we're going to dig in deeper and deeper. Just a heads up, um, the, the live stream is usually going to be Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be at a slightly different time next week because I'm going to be out uh, for client work out in California. And so um, I'm going to put post that on the stream as soon as I can figure out a good time. It might be a different day. Maybe it'll be Saturday. So we'll see about that. Um, so yeah, again, I would just encourage you to hang out for this stream and give test-driven development a try. There's all kinds of different views in the JavaScript world for testing, the test pyramid in particular, and the trade-offs for different uh, types of tests and when to write them. There's there all kinds of different tools, of course, especially in the React world. So there's lots of options. And if you have something that's working for you, that's great. I want to present one possibility, um, and I'm going to show you kind of the history, the 10-year background behind this approach to testing, and why I think it's one that's valuable to consider. Especially if you're feeling some of those pain points, like difficulty writing tests, difficulty knowing which kind of tests to start with, tests that are very coupled to the implementation and just don't feel like a good use of time, I think you should definitely take a look at this stream and see if test-driven development can help you. I'd love to stay in touch with you. I tweet a lot, and so uh, hit me up on Twitter. Give me a follow at Coding It Wrong. I have a lot of stuff to say, and you may be frustrated, or maybe it'll be entertaining, so it'll be good. Um, uh, follow me here on the Twitch channel, uh, or follow my YouTube channel, which is linked down below in Twitch, to get notifications of when the streams and when the, the, uh, the recordings are posted up. Again, uh, this recording and all of the live streams will be posted on YouTube to make this resource. I think this will actually be the first resource of its kind showing this particular brand of outside-in testing in the front-end world. So I'm really excited to do that. Um, if you're watching this, I'd love for you to join me in a future live stream if you're catching this after the fact. Uh, whether it's in this series or a future series, we'd love to have you join in or just interact on Twitter or anywhere else. So thanks for joining today. Thanks for joining along with us. And we're going to just dive head, head face first in to testing next time. Thanks a lot. And let's go to the slide.
There it is. See ya.